faith and grace this morning. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. He's good to us. Amen. Amen. Don't you love it when you write a message all week long and study for it all day Saturday and write it out and you walk in and God just changes the direction you want to go. Amen. I don't know if any of y'all know about that, but it's, it's real. Amen. And uh, coming here wanting to preach on the Spirit-filled life, we'll just cover that later on. And uh, But I just started thinking about how thankful I am to be saved. Start thinking about them folks who got saved. One of them folks who got saved during that meeting was just a 12-year-old little girl. But that is so important. It's so special. Because you look around at the community and where she's at and most likely what her life would be. Her family, I, just from what I heard, her, her, her mom's not in the picture and, and dad won't come to church and stepmom brings them and just just life, amen? Just hard life in a community that's overridden by drugs and abuse and all that stuff. And that little girl getting saved such a big deal because God's changed her. And even though she's going to have to be around some of that stuff, she's somebody different. She got saved. She truly got born again and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ and he died on the cross and rose from the grave. If she truly put her faith in that, the Holy Spirit of God moved in her life. And even in the midst of turmoil, even in the midst of all the judge, she can still have joy. She can still have peace because there's a God that created everything out there living inside of her. Telling her that he loves her when mom and dad don't love her. There's a God inside of her saying, I love you. I care about you. And she's somebody different than she was the week before. She come to church and she got saved and God changed her. Amen. And I'm sure and glad God can do the same thing for the old drunkard that's messed stuff up. For the old dope addict that's messed stuff up. God can step in that life and change everything about him. I'm glad God's changed me. And as the church, we all just build a worship and thank Him for the change He's made.
I've been changed. The pain is no longer there. The guilt is gone. chapter number 23, and I'm going to preach to you just a short message, thankful for the change the gospel makes in a man's life, amen? And uh, God's been pretty good to us. I don't deserve anything he's ever done. And uh, all I know is I did a whole lot of stuff that I shouldn't have done in my life, and a whole lot of stuff that deserved judgment, but God was there. To forgive me of my sins when I needed him. Amen. Amen. And uh, let's just read verse number 27 through 33 real fast. And there followed him a great company of people and of women. Which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said. Daughters of Jerusalem weep not for me. But weep for yourselves and for your children. He was, tell, he was telling daughters of Jerusalem. He was telling them Israelites. They're getting ready to put him on the cross. He's saying. Uh oh, you better weep for yourselves and your children and your children's children and generations to come. And, and, and the Jews are still suffering because of that decision, and they will until the tribulation begins. And they'll suffer then too. But he said, For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps that never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills and cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. There was, there was three crosses on that Mount Calvary. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. That's what I'm preaching on this morning. There they crucified him. Him. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Lord, bless the word this morning. God bless the preaching. Father, I pray you just take your people. I don't know why you put me on this this morning, God, but I'm praying you'll use it, God. I pray you'll take the people of God and remind us, God, what you've done for us. Remind us how wonderful it is to be saved. And God, through that, inspire us, encourage us to serve you with everything that we've got, dear Father. But God, remind us, God, of where we were the day you saved us and what you brought us from, Father. And dear God, if there be somebody here or somebody on live stream that's watching this morning, but God, do what you gloriously did for that girl that watched Monday night on the live stream and saved their soul as they sit at home. Yeah. Let them hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and that Jesus died for them and rose from the grave, God, and let them put their faith and trust in that but to save their soul from hell this morning, Father. But dear Lord, if there be somebody here, God, I pray the Holy Ghost of God will penetrate that heart, convict that soul, let them understand, God, it's not anxiety, it's not nervousness, but it's you, God. But dealing with their heart about their lost condition, dear God, and saved them from the depths of hell this morning, Father. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to preach to you this morning about that song that Brother Delbert sang. He said, had it not been, had it not been uh, for a place called Mount Calvary this morning. And I, in everybody's life this morning, there are some had it not been in your life. In my life, there, there are the insignificant had it not been. Had it not been for uh, that, that, that that, that thing, I wouldn't have had this happen to me. Had it not been, I got one for you. When I was traveling, right when I got called to preach, I was traveling down south uh, to preach in a meeting. Uh, I, I had gotten called the year before and I was going back to the same camp meeting. I knew they was going to let me preach. I was excited. I was pumped. I was going through them tunnels in Virginia. Any of y'all know about Virginia, amen? And I was going through them tunnels in You'll know what I'm talking about in a minute. I was going through them tunnels in Virginia and as I came out of that second one, what's the name of that town? Honey, huh? Bland. 
Hey, what a name. Bland. But I come to and drove into some town named Bland when I come out of that tunnel, and I was so pumped up about preaching. I had on some bluegrass. I don't even listen to bluegrass gospel. But I had on some bluegrass. Bang, 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 bang. Just banjo hit talk about Jesus. I'm flying through that tunnel. Hey, now, how many of y'all know the speed limit in that tunnel? I was going about 85, and I come out of that tunnel not even knowing how fast I'm going at 6 in the morning. Nobody's around us. I got nobody to gauge my speed on, and I come flying out of that thing. Guess what I see immediately when I come out? A speed trap and blue lights flashing at me, amen? And about $750 later, after they got, <laughs> wrote me one of them reckless drivers, told me I had to come to court. I had 10, 10 letters from lawyers in my mailbox when I got home. Tell me that ain't a racket. Had to pay a lawyer to go down and plead that down. They said it's a felony when you get a reckless driving. They had to plead it down for $500. They had to pay the court $250. $750 later, I didn't believe me, my love offering for preaching wasn't that. Hallelujah. And I... <laughs> $750 later, I'm thinking, had it not been for that stupid state police, had it not been for that bluegrass music, amen? But that is insignificant in reality. And then sometimes in your life, you have important had it not been. I remember, listen, that mom and dad forcing me to go to church and forced dragging me to church growing up. I said the only drug problem I had before the age of 13 was that my mom and dad drugged me to church. That's a pretty important had it not been, my friend. But had it not been for that base uh, understanding and, and teaching that they gave me, I don't know where I would have been when I got 24 years old and was a dope addict and didn't know what to do. I don't know if I'd have ran to Christ like I did. That was pretty important that they taught me that growing up. But then sometimes in your life, you'll run upon a uh, an imperative had it not been. I'm talking about one that counts. I'm talking about one that has to be there, my friend. And in the text today, we find one of those imperative had it not been, so my friend. Uh, listen, and that is the things we're going to preach on today had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary. Had it not been for the old rugged cross. Had it not been for a man named Jesus. Then forever my soul would be lost. Had it not been for the four words you're finding in the text today. Every single one of us would be on our way to a devil's hell. We'd have no reason for joy. We'd have no reason to get excited. We'd have no reason to go on from day to day because we'd be looking forward to our eternal destination. We'd clean every single day that we had. We'd try to turn the clocks back. We'd try to hold on to the family. We'd try to do everything we could because we'd 100% know that one day we'd go wake up in a devil's hell where we'd suffer for all of eternity. But had it not been <laughs> for a man named Jesus, hallelujah, I'm so thankful the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Listen, it's an imperative. Had it not been this morning, and there they crucified him. That's what it's all about. I'm going to just remind you of three had it not been that are imperative in your life this morning, and then we'll go to the restaurant. Amen. Hut number one, I want you to notice had it not been for the place. Had it not been for the place, that place this morning is a place called Calvary. That verse says, there they crucified him. Notice the word there. Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary. We use that term over and over and over. We talk about the cross. We talk about Calvary all the time. At Calvary, mercy there was great. Grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. We sing that hymn over and over. It's one of our favorites around here. But you sing it with no emotion. You sing it with no tear in your eye. You sing it with no thought about it. But if you truly thought about that, that place is where mercy, when you knelt down, listen, I'm talking figuratively now, when you knelt down at an altar one day, when you knelt down at your bedside one day, when you pulled off that road because yeah. God was dealing with your heart, and you finally said, Lord, I believe you. And God, I'm giving it all to you. I believe Jesus died for me. You've got a place in your life that you you take the devil back to and say, there's my place. There's my Calvary. There's where I called on the Lord and I know I'm saved. Hey, listen, and that there place is real important, my friend. Mercy.
mercy there was great, and grace it was free, and pardon there was multiplied to me. You needed mercy in your life. You couldn't buy his grace, but he gave it to you freely, my friend. And now, because of that grace, pardon has been applied to your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, man. Y'all done got me fired up this morning. That word Calvary, Strong's Concordance, reads it as crayon, and that means a place of a skull. Matthew 27, 33 says this, And when they were coming to the place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of a skull. Now I'll give you a couple, I'll give you a couple supposedly for a second. Supposedly theologians say that David brought the head of Goliath on to Jerusalem. Yes, we know that, the Bible said it. And he would have buried it outside the city wall. They say that that name Golgotha, which also has a meaning of Goliath of Gath, would have, it is where David buried the crushed head of that giant that defied the people of God. That, that, that's where, that, that, that's where that, that, that giant that fought David, and David went out in the power of God and hit that stone in his head. They say that's where he buried the head. Can I say that's the same place? Golgotha, where the son of David, the, the, the son of God, bruised the head of Satan, the accuser of the brethren for thousands of years. That's where he bruised his head. Amen. It's also the place, listen this one, 4,000 years before Calvary, that mountain range was known as Mount Moriah. Now, they don't know, theologians supposedly, they don't know which mountain. It was a mountainous area, and they don't know exactly which mountain it would have been. But that is the place where Abraham took his son Isaac when God told him uh, to do that supernatural sacrifice we preached on uh, a while back. God, Abraham took his son Isaac up on that mountain to sacrifice him. Isaac being a beautiful typology in the Old Testament of Jesus Christ. He was miraculously born. Jesus was a virgin born, miraculously conceived. He carried his own wood for his sacrifice. Isaac carried it up Mount Moriah. Jesus carried his cross up Mount Calvary, my friend. And he laid it up there to sacrifice. And listen, he, he was commanded by his father to do it. Abraham told Isaac to go. And God told Jesus to go, my friend. And listen, what an important place that is. And supposedly that's the same place where the typology in the Old Testament occurs. But I can tell you one thing that I know for sure happened there. I believe my inerrant infallible King James Bible. And I know it is the place where the Son of God died for the sins of man and shed his blood out on the cross of Calvary for you and I, my friend. Amen. Had it not been for a place called Calvary. Oh, that place called Calvary. I'm talking about a place where all the sin was lifted. <laughs> All the sin debt for the entire world was paid there. That sin debt that each and every one of us was born with and carried of the shame and the pain and the temptation, all, all of that was taken care of on the cross of Calvary. A place where all the guilt and all the shame was taken care of. A place where God makes that change in your life that I talked about a minute ago. I'm trying to tell you, you're looking at an old alcoholic that drank uh, so many years in his life. You're looking at an old dope deal and dope addict. You're looking at somebody that was so bound up in change. I could not quit. If I quit drinking, I start doing something else. I could not change who I was. But because I made it to a place called Calvary, God changed who I was. Amen. Hallelujah, a place called Calvary. Had it not been for a place, Calvary, had it not been for a penalty, the cross. The verse says there, they crucified him. And we can preach on that they too if you're looking at the words. There, Calvary. They, uh, you and me. He could have come down off that cross any time, but why did he stay there? The nails didn't keep him there. We did. Our sin. So that he could die for us. But they crucified him. God's plan for redemption for you and I had to be real. The penalty of sin in this world 
God had already destroyed the world because of sin before in the flood. And nobody listened to that old preacher. Noah sent his family and saved them, brought them through a type of salvation in the Old Testament. And then the world grew wicked again and God had to do something. It had to be something serious. So the world steeped in sin. That sin had to be paid for on the cross. Crucifixion. The cruelest, the most dreaded form of torture and death and sacrifice known to man. We talk about that cross all the time. Half of you probably got them hanging from your neck. Got, we got pennants of them. We got earrings of them. We've got them. If you drive, if you drove uh, from Belfry this morning, you probably saw a hundred crosses on the side of the road. I mean, we see crosses all the time. We see him after him. But I believe we lose the appreciation of that cross. Right. We lose it, y'all. We lose the appreciation of what it really means. When somebody mentions that cross, it's not enough to just think, well, that's where Jesus died. Listen, that's, that, that's where the world was changed. And I'm not even equipped to take you to a place to where you understand it. But you just got to think his passion as they bent him over and gave him those lashings of the cat of nine tails and Many people died on that whipping post and never even got up. So much of it that it exposed his inner organs, exposed the insides of his back. That whip just beating into him. Then they get him up and they throw a robe on top of that wound. They spit upon him and they rip his beard out. They, play a, uh, they put a, 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 a crown of thorns on his head and they smote him with a staff. They drive the two to three inch nails uh, in there, thorns into his head and blood dripping. And uh, the Bible says his, uh, after the beat, his visage, uh, you couldn't even tell who he was. Can you imagine? He is somewhat, if, if you think about your wife or your husband, if uh, they, they got in a street fight and they were beat so much that you had to go to the hospital and say, who is this? And they said, who is it? And you'd have to look at them and say, I don't know. I can't tell. Their face is falling apart. They beat his face in. I like fighting, but I like it when the ref jumps in when somebody's out. They beat his face in. They really, can you imagine if the robe and they, they laid on that wound and they began to dry it all as they mocked him and scoffed at him and they rip it back off of his back. Then he has to take that cross and begin to carry that cross up that hill. That's everyone, everyone's laughing at him. Everyone's making fun of him. And they're scoffing at him. As he's stripped naked in front of his mother, in front of the people he's led. He's stripped naked, shame and embarrassment thrown on the cross. And they begin to drive those spikes into his hands, severing the nerves that caused the pain all over his body. And they lift him up and he drops down in that probably two, three foot deep hole to hold that massive cross and it just rips in his flesh. And then he begins to try to push up to breathe because you know that crucifixion is so you cannot exhale. And as you're up there, you can breathe in just fine. But then you can't get the air out you got to push it out. you got to push up to get it out. He's pushing up. As they're laughing, flies swarming him. So bloody and beaten, you can't even tell who he is. <laughs> this is the cross, y'all. That's my Savior. We drive down the road, look at those crosses. That's my Savior. He did all that till he... Till he died. And he said, Till it's not, till it's not, it's finished. Father, I commend my spirit. They stab the spirit to his side. And it goes up. Dr. Sam, the Bible says water and blood come out. Doctors say that sack around that heart, when that happens and water and blood comes out, means your heart exploded. You got a broken heart. 
He did all that. It's real, y'all. Listen, do not treat this Bible like a fairy tale. Put yourself in it. There was real people standing at that cross watching him and seeing what he was doing for mankind. He died of a broken heart for your sin. Just a little bit off the off the track, but how in the world can Christians live the way they live knowing he did that for us? <laughs> how can we not just try to not live in sin? How can we not just try to be holy? How can we not just try to read and pray and not 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 drink and party and whatever else the problem is? Why? When he did all that, can't you muster up enough strength inside of you to say, I want to live for him? Can't you muster up enough strength in you to say, he did that for me, I'm going to do everything I can for him. <laughs> I love that old rugged cross. Y'all thought it's messed up I'd say it. Y'all know that old song, don't you? On a hill far away. To an old crooked cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Do you love the cross this morning? Amen. He took that penalty for our sins. Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for an old broken cross. Had it not been for a man called Jesus. Lastly, had it not been for a person, that is the Christ. The verse says, there they crucified him. There was a place, there was a penalty, but most importantly, there was a person named Jesus. Not you, you wouldn't have sufficed, I wouldn't have sufficed. The apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they were the suffice, but Jesus was the only one, the virgin born, son of God. And the, there's a superscription, Luke 23 and 38, and it says, also was written over him in letters Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. I believe that was in jest, or that was uh, just... Uh, whatever you call it, but it was truth. Can I tell you now that I'm saved by the grace of God? He's my king. It's the best place to be in your life, to be a servant of the king. Oh, oh God, help us. Let me read you what a man said in old, old preacher from California, S.M. Lockridge. He said, do you know him? Well, my king is the king of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. He's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords. He said, I'm coming to tell you this, that the heavens of heavens can't contain him. Let alone some men explain him. I'm doing my best this morning trying to explain it to you. Get you excited about what he's done for you. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hands. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Herod couldn't kill him. Pilate couldn't find his fault with him. Death couldn't handle him and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king this morning. Is that who you're serving? Is that, is that who you're serving? Lord and devil, y'all come back and sing that song. All heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. Let me ask you this this morning. I've got a twofold invitation. Is Jesus your king? Do you know 100% sure in your life that there's a time that you call on Jesus Christ? Said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me and rose from the grave, proven to be God. 
Please, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I'm putting my faith and trust in you. There's got to be a time in your life where you may not have said that exact prayer. Listen, I, I believe as soon as you turn your heart to God, you're saved, and that prayer is just affirmation, proof. But is there a time in your life that you know you turn to Christ? If you died right now, listen, most people that come sit in a church house or that watch church online, there's an inkling or there's something they believe the story. They may not have put their faith in Christ, but they believe the story. They come on Easter's. They come on Christmases. And, and, and you know, but, but I'm not asking you if you believe the story this morning. I'm asking those in the room and those online, have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith and trust in Him to save you from your sin? There's many folks that will say a prayer that don't mean it and it's not with all their heart and they live a life with no victory and no peace like myself claiming that I was saved when I was 24 years old selling dough and doing all that different stuff you, I, listen I don't want to cast any doubt the Holy Spirit will do that for you you just need to know you're saved this morning you need to know you're saved if you're in here and you'll say, Preacher, I 100% know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. There's no way I could go to hell. Would you slip your hand up and say to me, Preacher, I'm saved on my way to heaven. I see hands. I see hands. Amen. Amen. You can put them down. This morning, if you'd say, Preacher, I don't know about that place. I don't know about that penalty. I don't know about that person. I've never put my faith and trust in all that, and I'm lost. Preacher, if I died right now, I'd split hell wide open. Would you have the courage just to let me pray for you? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. Just say, Preacher, it's me. Just with a hand. Just a hand up and back down. Preacher, it's me. I'm not saved. I see that hand. Anybody else in here? Say, Preacher, that's me. Preacher, that's me. I see that hand. Anybody in the room? I see that hand. Anybody else in the room? Say, Preacher, I'm lost. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, my prayer warriors are praying right now. Today can be the best day of your life. I promise you, all that's true that I just preached to you. You probably would lift your hand unless the Holy Spirit was telling you in your heart. I wonder, here in just a minute, after I pray, we start invitation. They'll sing a verse of this. I wonder if you just walk up here to me. Let me show you this Bible. Listen, the people in this room will rejoice. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. There's nothing to be ashamed about. It don't matter if you've made a profession before. Listen, you just need to make sure. We're not counting numbers here. You just need to make sure with the Lord. And don't let this, we're going to rejoice. You're going to have a new family. I wonder when they start to sing, if you just stand up, tell the people next to you if you need to to move, and just come up here to the front and let me and my wife lead you to Jesus Christ. Would you do that this morning? I'm going to pray, and when they start singing, that's your cue to come. Father, I love you. God, thank you for sending your son to die for us. Father, I'm begging you, God, that those that you're dealing with that's lifted their hand, God, I pray. God, I know you will not force them because it's free will, God. They can choose to go to heaven. They can choose to go to hell. God, but I'm praying right now you will remove every hindrance. God, I pray that you will bind the demons of hell that is trying to take their mind away from what's going on. I'm praying you'll bind the forces of evil that's talking them out of making a move, talking them out of calling on your name. And God, I'm begging you, Lord, God, to help them and give them strength. Let them see how wonderful it is, Father. Lord, please. Jesus, precious holy name. Amen. Y'all say. If you lift your hand, would you come get saved this morning? Just stand up, walk to the front, and I'm going to.